Hello, everyone. My name is Erwin uh, Goldstein. I am Director of San Diego Sexual Medicine and Director of Sexual Medicine at Alvarado Hospital. I'm a clinical professor of surgery at the University of California at San Diego. It is indeed my honor and pleasure to work with Michelle Day and Steve Edelman and the whole TCOYD virtual conference team to talk about uh, a taboo subject, <laughs> erectile dysfunction and male health issues. I've been in this field for over 40 years and uh, I'm a, I call myself a sexual medicine doctor and I'll describe that to you shortly. Um, um, and I hope you learn a lot. And I hope uh, if you have a life quality problem because of sexual issues that we can help you. So here we go, I'm about to start the slide deck. All right, so the slide is, uh, um, um, the topic is, uh, there we go. How to, uh, um, um, things are looking up, of, uh, uh, erectile dysfunction and male, issue, male health issues. I probably have to thank Steve for the title, uh, but uh, there we go. So I wanna thank everybody. And uh, we're gonna have this talk divided into, I guess, five segments. And we're gonna start with some introduction stuff on sexual medicine. So men's and women's uh, health issues are fundamental basic uh, human rights. Uh, your health care for, let's say, your heart, your kidney, your pancreas, your muscles, your bones, whatever, they're fundamental human rights. But you know that sexual health care is also a fundamental human right. And you should be able to take care of your penis or as a woman, your clitoris, your vagina, uh, so that you uh, can have a better quality of life. These are uh, defined fundamental and basic uh, human rights. So um, you know as a as, as a patient that there are different kinds of doctors and there are doctors who work on the left in the emergency room, family medicine, all the way down. But you'll notice my name tag, it says, I'm a physician in sexual medicine and I work at Alvarado Hospital and, and God bless Alvarado for embracing the concept of sexual medicine. It's a subspecialty of all of medicine that focuses on the study, diagnosis and treatment of the sexual health concerns of men and women. It's a hugely important uh, subspecialty, and there are very few providers who specialize in this. Um, we practice at San Diego Sexual Medicine, a 6,000 square foot facility with over 10 employees, all dedicated to uh, the study of the diagnosis and the treatment of men and women with uh, sexual health concerns. We use a bio, musculoskeletal, psychosocial model. Uh, so on the upper left, you can see that uh, uh, my primary focus is the physiologic. We have uh, a group that does pelvic floor physical therapy for the musculoskeletal, and we have a sex therapist that does the uh, biopsychosocial uh, construct in uh, the entire sort of gamut of sexual dysfunction. So we cover the bio, the musculoskeletal, and the psychosocial within our practice. And we apply the basic principles of evidence-based medicine uh, to help uh, men and women with sexual health problems. Uh, those are the journals of our Sexual Medicine Society. Um, I am the current editor of the Sexual Medicine Reviews, that's the gold one. Uh, for 10 years, I was the editor of the red one, the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Um, we have lots of literature on uh, diabetic uh, 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 or diabetes and sexual health issues. Here's a, a paper uh, published uh, and the underlying red areas are showing that ED is common and distressing um, and that ED is multifactorial and is more severe and more resistant to treatment compared with non-diabetic ED. And there's really just uh, many, many uh, papers uh, examining and researching uh, sexual dysfunction and diabetes. Here's another one. Uh, men with diabetes are at greater risk for ED uh, a large number of people, 60% of men reported ED uh, who were diabetic. And uh, the risk factors uh, they found were age, how well you control your uh, glucose level and what your body weight is, or what we call the BMI, uh, were predictors of the sexual problem. Here's another one that suggests that uh, uh, having ED is a precursor or a marker to a subsequent, say, heart attack or cardiovascular event. So if you have ED as a diabetic, it's really important to get care so that we can uh, 
pay attention um, and uh, help uh, manage uh, the uh, risk factors so that you don't then go and get um, uh, a subsequent cardiovascular event. Um, here's another one um, that uh, deals with erectile dysfunction, noting to be one of the first problems of uh, diabetes and that uh, there's also uh, low testosterone values in men who have diabetes, that there's also ejaculation problems uh, and low libido problems. And there's many different issues associated uh, with uh, um, sexual issues. And the last part of the underlined results section says that women have, uh, who have diabetes have sexual problems. And they also complain of multiple versions of the sexual problem. I just show this slide to, to sort of warrant the reality that uh, metrics of quality of life, uh, which are low physical satisfaction, uh, low emotional satisfaction, uh, and uh, 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 happiness uh, um, are all um, uh, problematic in people with erectile dysfunction and people with low desires. These are meaningful um, um, complaints that people have because they truly affect in great detail uh, quality of life. So the numbers of 4.38, uh, a number of one would mean that it doesn't involve life quality changes, but four is four times uh, uh, um, one, meaning that it has significant effect on life quality. Now we're gonna spend some time on anatomy and physiology. So for those who didn't do <laughs> sex ed in their high school and uh, beyond, uh, I'm gonna give you your sex ed class. So um, what are the things that are required to have sexual function? So you need sort of a, a neural network, which would be the brain and the nerves. Uh, then you need a vascular network, uh, blood directing to the organ and blood leaving the organ and regulating that. And then of course, uh, hormones are important, specifically testosterone, but uh, uh, other hormones are important. And of course, you need to be psychologically intact um, and interested and uh, feeling safe and without uh, anxiety and depression and those types of issues. So those are simple dimple ways to think about factors that influence your sexuality. Uh, from the male uh, perspective, specifically for erection, there really uh, are uh, these four issues that are involved in, in our evaluation. It's really important to assess the quality of the tissue in the penis. It's really a, 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 an important a metric for uh, the uh, prediction of uh, erectile function. And we have a very special ultrasound that uh, has a high uh, uh, frequency of hertz. It's 15.4 hertz, uh, megahertz on the, uh, on the probe. And uh, within one millimeter, we have excellent resolution of uh, tissue. So in the erect state, we, we place the probe and we could see uh, with high resolution, the quality of the tissue. And not everybody has this type of ultrasound. Uh, we also look for arterial blood inflow. We also measure the integrity of nerves and we also measure uh, the hormonal milieu. So we get a good biologic evaluation. Um, I always show this slide. I hope it doesn't offend anyone. This is a man and woman who uh, were paid their models and they went into an MRI unit and had intercourse. So be prepared for this talk. Uh, there's the male erection inside the woman's vagina. Uh, I'm going to use the pointer here. Hopefully that will help. There's the woman's clitoris is here. Here's her urethra, her bladder, her uterus, her cervix. The erect penis is in contact with the service, cervix. Uh, the male penis, uh, the male bladder, the seminal vesicles, the urethra of the male. Um, um, here's the testicles, the vas deferens. These are all uh, there. And I think I showed this slide in particular because to have intercourse, the erect penis needs to overcome the resistance posed by the vagina. So heterosexual intercourse, um, um, the vagina poses uh, 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 resistances. So there's the labia uh, majora and labia minora. Uh, there's the uh, vestibule, which is the tissue just 
uh, uh, prior to the opening of the vagina, then there's the hymen, and then there's the vaginal canal, which is surrounded by its own uh, muscle. So for the penis to enter, it needs to overcome that. So uh, rigidity is critical, rigidity in what's called the axial direction, so that's the up and down direction. And uh, typically to achieve vaginal intercourse, uh, the penis needs to bear a weight of one kilogram, 2.2 pounds, uh, without buckling. And uh, we can assess the quality of erections in a one, two, three, four scale. Four would be the best erection, uh, the closest to uh, the ability to bear the weight of one kilogram. And three would be 20% less, two would be 20% less, and one would be 20% less in terms of axial rigidity. Now, uh, how does the flaccid penis become an erect penis? Uh, I'm going to take you through that. It's really uh, erection 101, if you like. So if you start at the top, sexual arousal needs to occur, uh, occur. So you need to be interested, and that's where the brain issue comes in. You need to transfer that information through nerves, and that's into here. And then the neurologic uh, information takes the, the smooth muscle, which is the primary tissue of the erection chamber, uh, in the flaccid state, that muscle is contracted. Your penis is more like a sponge being wrung in the flaccid state. That's what keeps it small. For example, if you go swimming in, in the cold Pacific Ocean, your penis gets really small as the muscle contracts even more. And uh, the contracted muscle uh, makes the penis sort of different from other muscles where in the baseline state, most muscles are totally relaxed. If you are listening to this lecture, your feet are probably, the muscles of your feet are probably relaxed, the muscles of your shoulder are probably relaxed, but your penis is actually contracting a lot. Now, during sexual arousal, the muscle goes from a contracted state to a relaxed state, and that allows the tissue to expand. So the penis gets wider and longer uh, during erection. Uh, now, if you notice, this is a flaccid state, the muscle is contracted, there's actually a space, very important con concept, space between the edge of the peripheral tissue inside the erection chamber and its wall. And in that space are the veins that drain the blood. So you have arteries coming in and veins draining the blood in the flaccid state. However, in the erect state, with the tissue expanded as much as it can, it actually closes that space down. You see, here's the space and here's no space. That means these veins are actually shut down. So that's really important because that means there's no escape of blood. The, the penis becomes a closed compartment. And the pressure of the penis is the pressure of the artery bringing blood in. And here's a closed compartment, penile erection, rigid in the axial direction, greater than one kilogram, so it can achieve uh, 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 penetration. Now, the ability of the tissue to expand is based on the, the degree to which muscles are relaxed, but also on the quality of the erection tissue. So we use the term erectile tissue homogeneity, uh, which is an ultrasound finding, uh, getting back to the use of ultrasound as predictors for doing well with erectile uh, activity. Um, and I'm gonna show you more of that in a few seconds. Now, how can you uh, uh, medically uh, examine the erect penis? We use the grayscale ultrasound. Here's a special probe, 15.4 megahertz. That's placed in different parts of the penis, the part near the scrotum, the part furthest away from the scrotum near the head and the part in the middle. We have various settings. So we use the same settings for all patients. And here's what we see. On the right, this side, that's uh, the normal. And you can see this is the erectile tissue homogeneity that we see. This is a biopsy, the healthy penis, and it's primarily muscle. These are the spaces where the blood goes. Uh, the, the, the primary... Uh, muscle means that blood can go through every nook and cranny within the erection chamber. And here's the blood flow, and here are the arteries, and these are all the things we can see. However, the stuff on the left, you can see that there's no uh, consistent homogeneity because you see black spaces within the tissue. And these black spaces are regions where blood can't go. So these are actually scars. So you see this blue uh, tissue here, that's scar. Blood can't go where there's scar. And scar is introduced when smooth muscle cells die due to age and due to uh, traumas and due to diabetic nerve damage and due to uh, hormone issues. Uh, uh, the, the, the prospect of erectile tissue scarring is a problem and it prevents the expansion of the tissue as we'll soon see. 
Here's the normal penis. We've already talked about this. Here's the blood flow coming in and the flaccid state, the muscles contracted. There's the space, the blood drains out and you have blood in and blood out. However, in the erect state with the tissue expanded in, in, in length and in girth, uh, this space gets eliminated. These veins get compressed. You now have the closed compartment. This depended on two things to achieve the expansion. One, the muscle relaxing, and two, the tissue being homogeneous, as you see here. It needs to be homogeneous. Now, here's a penis with scar tissue in it, and you can see the scar tissue is these sort of black spaces where this has no black spaces, and here are the black spaces. In the presence of black spaces, the tissue does not expand easily. Thus, during erection, the space isn't closed. That means blood is escaping during the erection, and you lose energy. Loss of energy means the penis is not rigid in the axial direction and fails to have the ability to overcome the resistances by the vagina. So hopefully this uh, little introduction helps you understand uh, better uh, this physiology. Now are hormones involved? Sure, hormones are very, very involved. Testosterone acts on many, many uh, uh, tissues in the body. You can see it, it also involves itself uh, with the uh, penis. And you can see that aging, uh, and specifically aging and diabetes, uh, shows that testosterone falls with age. And there's a binding protein called sex hormone binding globulin uh, that increases with age. And the problem with the SHBG increasing is that it will bind the testosterone having less free testosterone available. So you have this little sort of uh, model here the SHBG is that larger protein. And if it's uh, present in high values, it will bind to the testosterone, therefore rendering it not available. It's only the free testosterone that gets in the cell and promotes protein synthesis. So here are all the things that testosterone does. These are all the factors that come out of testosterone. And many of these are really important for sexual function. So having a healthy testosterone is sort of relevant. Now we're going to get on to the third aspect of the talk, which is pathophysiology or how things go bad. We've already sort of talked about the tissue version where this is the normal situation. Uh, the abnormal situation would be scarring of the tissue, but you can also have scarring of the artery so that the lumen, if this is a large lumen, uh, the, if the scarring of the artery makes the lumen even smaller so that energy, the pressure coming in is less and the speed with which filling happens is less. And of course, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, artery blockages are not uncommon in diabetes. So artery blockages and tissue scarring, the combination uh, lead to problems with penile erection. Here's a, a sort of a, a summary of uh, diabetes, uh, uh, also cholesterol and blood pressure issues uh, causes uh, or is associated with atherosclerosis. So, Atherosclerosis is artery blockage and tissue scarring. The tissue scarring, as, as we've seen before, prevents the tissue from expanding. So the outflow is not regulated well, and then the, the tissue gets less hard. Here's the study that I did many years ago, just to show you uh, my <laughs> involvement in the field. We took a bunch of patients who were getting penile implant surgery, some of, the, some of whom were diabetic. diabetic. Um, we, we uh, uh, at the time of the implant, we biopsied their tissue under permission from the patient, and we sent it to a laboratory to do what's called uh, histomorphometry that would define the percentage of tissue that was muscle uh, versus the percentage of tissue that was scar tissue. So if 40% uh, is muscle, then 60% is scar tissue. If 30% is muscle, then 70% uh, then is uh, scar tissue. And these were the uh, patients in the study. And prior to them having the implant, we did tests of their ability to trap the blood in the penis. And one test was how, when the person was erect, how much flow could go in the penis. Arguably, if the person had a closed compartment, then the flow to maintain the erection would be close to zero. So again, if you had good smooth muscle content, the flow to maintain was quite zero. As you started developing scarring, as the tissue couldn't expand because it was scarred, you required more flow to maintain the erection. So this is a study many years ago that showed us the importance of tissue histomorphometry. So back to this slide, uh, we've already shown it. On the right, erectile tissue homogeneity is really critical uh, and allows for uh, uh, 
blood to be trapped in the penis and erectile tissue in homogeneity, in homogeneity or heterogeneity uh, is consistent with scar tissue, which is consistent with inability to expand, which is consistent with loss of, uh, of blood during the erection. It's not a closed compartment anymore and you lose rigidity and erectile dysfunction uh, follows. All right, now we're gonna talk about how to manage. This is of course uh, why you're listening. <laughs> so let's uh, get very good at this. Um, medicines, medicines have been out since 1998. They've gone from being very expensive to very inexpensive. This is good RX. I just did this uh, just prior to the talk. 30 pills for 12 bucks. <laughs> 30 pills for 12 bucks using GoodRx. If you're paying more than that, you're paying too much. Uh, this is Cialis, a tiny bit more. And then you get into more expensive things which you really don't need. You, you really should be focusing on either the Viagra Cialis option. Another option is a vacuum a device with a constriction band. Here's a new version. Uh, my favorite constriction band is called Giddy, G-I-D-D-Y. Uh, uh, it's easy, easy on because it's more of a, a C-shaped and here are the, the flanges and you put a rubber band on the flange. So you don't slide a rubber compartment on the penis, you apply the C thing uh, and then uh, the flanges allow you to constrict. So it's much easier, the giddy constriction ring. For those who've never seen penile injection, uh, it's not that complicated. Uh, here's the penis, the top part, here's the top part, the bottom part, here are the sides. The top part is too many nerves and arteries. The bottom part is the urinary system. So the only place you can stick the needle is on the side. And here is uh, demonstrating the, the injection going into the side, specifically at the bottom. And after you put the needle in, you compress for three minutes so that if there is bleeding during the event, uh, the bleeding is stopped. It's not different when you draw blood from your arm, you hold the area for three minutes so it doesn't bleed also. We have many, many hundreds of uh, patients doing self-injection therapy. We even in some situations have the partner help with self-injection therapy. It's a critical uh, treatment uh, because it hyper relaxes the tissue. So if you have scarring of your penis, if you hyper relax, you can counter the effect of the, the scarring of the tissue, the erectile tissue in homogeneity. Another treatment is the penile implant. We do many of these. They're quite successful uh, in people who fail medical management. Uh, this is called the coloplast. Uh, the, there's a pump component in the scrotum. Uh, there, the, the cylinders are in the erection chambers and the reservoir is what we call the space of rest. This sort of near the, uh, the blood. has been very successful. Uh, this treatment option has been available since the early 1970s and many, many, many patients have penile implant. The, the critical question from people who are not interested in uh, some of those treatments is, can you get back <laughs> uh, more healthy tissue? If I have inhomogeneity, which is scarring or fibrosis, can I reverse that? That's been a real challenge. It's a new part of our field. And uh, we're uh, certainly putting a lot of effort and attention to this. So basically, when a person walks in our office, there's a whole diagnostic uh, event. We see the sex therapist, the public floor physical therapist. This is our biomusculoskeletal uh, psychosocial assessment. We do the erection hardness scale, that one, two, three, four thing. We do physical examination, hormones, nerves uh, testing, and we do the ultrasound uh, with that fancy 15.4 megahertz pro. Now, uh, symptomatic treatment, we've already talked about the pills, the constriction devices, the vacuum erection devices, the self-injection therapy, the penile implant. We're gonna now talk about disease modification strategies. Can we change the underlying pathology? So it's, an, it's a fabulous question and we're gaining more and more information about this. So this is one way to look at it. You have healthy tissue when you start, you get your diabetes, you get scar tissue, and then you have an, an existing cell that lives in your penis. It's a mesenchymal stem cell that makes the healthy uh, penile tissue. Of the things it makes, among the other things, it, it makes the smooth muscle cells, which then populates it with healthy cells. So ideally, if we can stimulate the mesenchymal stem cell to make more smooth muscle cells, theoretically, we can reverse the equation. So we can go back from scarring into erectile tissue, or at least less scar. So our number one strategy now is called erect 
penile shockwave therapy. I'll repeat it, erect penile shockwave therapy. Fascinating new uh, therapy. You may know and understand shockwave treatment if you've had a kidney stone. Uh, shockwave treatment is the way you turn the kidney stone into dust, basically. Uh, a, a shockwave, for those who are not familiar, is a, a, an acoustic wave. I'm talking to you, I'm making an acoustic wave, but it travels faster than the speed of sound. That's 767 miles an hour. If you were a jet plane traveling faster than 767 miles an hour, you'd make a sonic boom. Uh, shock waves are extremely short in duration. They're just in microseconds. There's a very fast onset to a high pressure of about 90 uh, 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 megapascals. Uh, and then it goes uh, down fast uh, to a, a negative and then ex expands to about three microseconds. Really short sort of event uh, that happens uh, uh, as a shockwave. And again, uh, for those who had urology sh kidney stones, shockwave has been used. Those are the high intensity shockwaves. We're using the low intensity, about one tenth the value. So the, the units are millijoules per square millimeter. A joule is the movement of a weight of a kilogram, one meter in, in, in length. You, you push it one me, me, meter and the energy that you've done is called a joule. So uh, low intensity uh, shock waves, which is what we use for erect penile shock wave, are about 0 0.05 up to 0 0.16 millijoules per square millimeter. And these things increase blood flow. They don't pulverate things into powder. They increase blood flow, they activate connective tissue, they ameliorate pain, they heal wounds, and they increase stem cells and genital tissues, and we have data for that. So here's the probe applied. We make the penis erect with one of the injections, and the, the shock waves are applied to the tissue. They will activate stem cells, stem cells will make muscle, muscle will repopulate the tissue and lessen the degree of erectile tissue in homogeneity, that's the, the plan. Now, uh, sadly, uh, we're in the United States and there's a lot of scamming uh, people out there. And one of the scams is acoustic therapy versus shockwave therapy. And you've, there are different brands, I'm not gonna name them, but uh, be very careful when you're considering acoustic therapy versus shockwave therapy. Uh, the acoustic therapy really delivers what's called ballistic radial pressure waves. And they are clearly not shockwaves. Here is the pattern, this, this low, uh, thing, very long in duration, no energy, never goes negative. That's the, uh, uh, a ballistic pressure wave. And there's no data to support its use at all. There's plenty of data, more than 10 years of data with shockwave. Um, so we use the device called Eurogold, a 100 MTS. Uh, that's what it looks like. It's uh, in water. So it's electrohydraulic. And uh, well, if you don't know, but I'll explain to you, sound travels five times faster in water than it does in air. The molecules are more close and compact in water. Uh, it's not significant risk uh, in humans. Uh, uh, the probe we use is not focused. Uh, uh, in, in shockwave therapy, it's typically focused because of the kidney stone. It's focused right on the kidney stone, uh, but you don't want that for your penis. You'd rather an unfocused probe for your penis. Now, here are the data, and there's many, many data sets like this that show here are stem cells prior to shockwave, and here are stem cells after shockwave, the population is increased, mitochondria are added to the cell uh, of the stem cell to give it energy to do uh, more population. Now, here is a, a patient who presented uh, in June, uh, excuse me, July of 2019, and he has erectile tissue in homogeneity at the four uh, different settings that we used in the mid shaft of his penis. We did six treatments of erect penile shockwave therapy, and we repeated the, uh, the ultrasound uh, uh, after the six treatments. I want you to look carefully. Here's erectile tissue in homogeneity. It's not perfect, but it is far more homogeneous compared to what it used to be. Uh, we now have done many of these, and we now have a growing evidence <coughs> that we are uh, developing that uh, erect penile shockwave therapy does have the ability to make the tissue more homogeneous and give back better function. This is really important. So uh, our first 31 patients who had the six uh, treatments during erection, 58% of patients had improved erectile tissue homogeneity, 13% of patients uh, stayed the same, 21, 29% of patients didn't 
improved, uh, their disease worsened as they were going on. Um, um, they rated their clinical improvement as 71% using the patient global impression of improvement as the metric for improvement. 61% uh, of patients uh, uh, expressed improvement on the uh, Im improvement scale um, who had evidence of erectile tissue improvement. All right, uh, getting out of erections. We're finally done with erections. We're now talk about penises that are instead of straight or curved, that's called Peyronie's disease. These are the various different curvatures that can happen. In this case, there is scarring. It's not the same location as the scarring. The scarring is not in the erectile tissue. That would affect erectile function. This is scarring in the, 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 the container around the penis called the tunic albuginea, and it prevents uh, stretching. We have two agents that we inject directly into the scar. One is called interferon, and one is called Xiaflex, X-I-A-F-L-E-X, -E which is a FDA-approved collagenase. It's an enzyme that actually digests the collagen. So that at the end of the day, someone who had curvature and his penis was uh, bent, uh, let's say, uh, if I read it, is uh, 75 degrees. Now the penis is far less bent. Uh, and we inject the drug at the level of the scar right here. All right, so now testosterone replacement therapies. There's lots of different ones of them, and we're going to go over them. There's gels, injections, patches, solutions, uh, things under your tongue. There's uh, things to spray on your thigh. There's pellets to put in and uh, other kinds of gel uh, uh, delivery systems. Uh, here's an example of an injection. This is done once a week. The gels and solutions are typically done every day. This is uh, the issue of a pellet that goes in and it lasts from four to six months. And we typically do, uh, let's say 10 uh, pellets at a time. I wanna to present to you for the first time, God bless America, we now have for the first time the option of an oral testosterone. We've been waiting for an oral testosterone. You know, we have the gels and the pellets and the patches and the, and, and the injections but not everybody enjoys those strategies. Most people like taking pills if they have a medicine. So finally, finally, that's come out. The name of the product is Jatenzo. It is a 237 milligram because it's testosterone undecanoate. Uh, that, so it's these odd numbers. Uh, so what you do is you take the uh, two pills, one in the morning, one at night with food. You have to take it with food. It gets absorbed into your lymphatic system. So that's why it doesn't go to the liver, which is the, the, the problem with oral pills. So this group figured it out to avoid the liver. Um, and then after the seventh day, you take the pill in the morning and around noon, you take a blood test. And then the blood test will allow us to see if this starting dose is the correct dose for you. So there's a titration concept. So you start with 237 twice a day. Uh, you take on the seventh day your pill in the morning, you take around noon a blood test, you look at the blood level, uh, here are the guidelines for that. If you're less, we titrate up. If you're too high, we titrate down. If you're correct, we stay the same. So at the end of the day, uh, about a quarter of the people stay on the opening uh, titration, 72% titrate up, and a few percent of people titrate down. So very exciting. Uh, I have a lot, a lot of patients now on, on this Jatenso product. They're, they're very, very uh, uh, satisfied with this new product. Uh, for people who are concerned about prostate cancer and testosterone, I want to talk about what's called saturation theory of the prostate. Uh, you, if you have very, very low testosterone values, as you increase testosterone, you will grow the prostate. So hormonally sensitive tissue growth is the prostate. When you get to a certain value, typically, let's say 125 nanograms per deciliter, which is very, very low, uh, you reach the point where all the receptors are saturated for testosterone. So you actually increasing testosterone does not make the prostate bigger. This concept of saturation theory allows us to provide testosterone without the fear of uh, people getting testosterone associated uh, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, because once you, once your PSA is fine on a certain dose, increasing that dose uh, does not encourage any growth of the prostate. Now, we're going to go through this relatively quickly. Does testosterone improve? And it's going to be X. In this case, it's bone health. And the answer is placebo does not. Uh, uh, placebo does not uh, change uh, bone mineral density, but testosterone does. Yes, testosterone improves bone health. 
testosterone improve how you pee, lower urinary tract symptoms. If you have difficulty peeing, would taking testosterone be beneficial? The answer is yes. People who have uh, uh, the International Prostate Symptom Score goes down as you take testosterone. So a fascinating outcome is take testosterone if you have difficulty voiding. Uh, the, uh, is testosterone associated with uh, blood pressure issues? Yes, it lowers blood pressure. This is the diastolic blood pressure, uh, and it, uh, this is the systolic blood pressure. So taking testosterone lowers blood pressure. Does it lower waist circumference? Would you like to lower your waist circumference? Yes, testosterone lowers your waist circumference. Does testosterone lower your fat mass? Yes, because it takes... Uh, uh, the stem cell that would otherwise go to fat and it turns it into muscle. So it actually improves your muscle mass. These are uh, uh, data supporting that uh, fat is reduced um, in, in patients. Does it improve erectile function? Yes, of course it does. Uh, these are data showing that it uh, uh, improves erectile function uh, because it's making the tissue more responsive, makes more proteins, uh, um, Agents that re relax the muscle are improved, such as nitric oxide. Does testosterone lower cholesterol? Uh, the answer is yes. So cholesterol is falling. These are all things that fall, and these are uh, examples of why testosterone is so important, especially in patients with uh, diabetes. Here is the falling of cholesterol with diabetes. Uh, the HDL, which is the good cholesterol, increases. That's another important point. Now to the diabetic population. Does testosterone lower blood sugar? And does it lower hemoglobin A1C? Drum roll, ba da 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 dum, yes. Uh, you know, lifestyle plus 1% testosterone gel actually changed the A1C into the normal range, the non diabetic range. It's pretty cool. Uh, so, lifestyle alone and lifestyle with testosterone gel uh, were very important in helping uh, this uh, treatment work. Premature ejaculation is another uh, entity that we work with. We are finding a lot of cool new things about premature ejaculation. Uh, we think in some men it's what's called a penile dysesthesia. There's one region marked out in blue here where there's uh, very hypersensitive skin, nerves that are way too hypersensitive. And we this is an agent that's numbing uh, that one region and that person uh, uh, had a dramatic improvement in the control of his ejaculation. How about desire and poor orgasm? We see a lot of that. We now have fabulous new medicines, FDA approved medicines to improve desire. Uh, here's one called bremelanotide. Here's another one called flubanserin. And we can use these agents in, in, in patients such as you <laughs> who has problems with desire or problems with orgasm. At the end of the day, uh, people who have low interest and poor orgasm have their brain sort of set in excess inhibition and reduced excitation, and these agents and other strategies help change the dynamics to go from uh, higher excitation and less inhibition. So what's the summary? Here's my final slide. Diabetes is commonly associated with various sexual dysfunctions. Uh, they're all listed here. Sexual medicine is a subspecialty of medicine that focuses on the study, diagnosis, and treatment of men and women with sexual health problems. So if you have a problem, we can work together. We in sexual medicine know a lot about this stuff. Uh, we can work with each person and their partner in a multidisciplinary fashion using contemporary strategies, biopsychosocial strategies, new ones, like the ultrasound machine, like the oral testosterone, all the cool new things that we're doing, new drugs to improve orgasm, new drugs to improve libido. And we will improve your life quality and that of your partner. So. Uh, to Michelle and uh, uh, the group at TCOID, um, everybody, thank you for uh, Steve. God bless you for keeping me in your uh, in your vision. <laughs> uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Hope you learn, and uh, I hope you uh, can have a better sex life. Thank you so very much.